Welcome everyone to another episode of Elbows Tight Podcast. It's your host Travis and John. John, how are we doing today? I'm doing great, man. That was a great podcast. I think everyone's going to enjoy it. Um, UK Mike was a cool dude. Yeah, today we have UK Mike. You might recognize him from the Jordan Teaches Jiu Jitsu uh, YouTube channel. He's usually the UK for Jordan. And then also he's uh, one of the co-hosts for Jordan Talks Jiu Jitsu. And he is currently a blue belt under Jordan Pressinger up in Ontario, 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 Canada. And uh, this was a great conversation. I really wanted to talk to Mike because uh, in the podcast, he talks a lot about like mental health and like how jiu really helped him overcome a lot of, you know, adversity in his life. And he's a super cool guy. And it was just a great conversation, you know, just a couple blue belts talking about being blue belts, you know, so uh, we, we go heavy into like the mental health issue and how jujitsu can help with that. Uh, we are not saying get off your medication, you know what I mean? But jujitsu could help. And if you know someone that's going through some stuff and that they they need something to help them, jujitsu could be that thing for them. You know what I mean? For so, sure. Just another form of medication. Yeah. Yeah. So it was a, it was a whole lot of fun. Uh, leading up to this interview, Mike was a little nervous because he's never been a guest on a podcast before. He's only been on Jordan's podcast as a host. So I think he did a fantastic job, John. What about you? I think he did great, man. I, was like, I didn't even see any nerves. I, th- I thought yeah. he did fine. Yeah, so everything's going to be down in the description below if you guys want to go follow him or talk to him and listen to his podcast and his story. Uh, he's he, I think he's actually a great host and a great guest you know so hopefully you guys really enjoy this uh remember to leave us a five-star review on itunes and spotify that is the biggest way to help the podcast out besides sharing it with other people because that's how people actually find us for sponsorships and and whatnot we get recommended a whole lot more so give us a five-star review on those follow us on instagram facebook tiktok uh, send us a patch if you guys want to exchange patches we still have a butt ton of patches if people want to go and buy them or exchange them you can we can exchange patches uh someone just sent us one um if you guys pay attention to our stories we put them on the stories and whatnot so but john you got anything else nothing man and everybody enjoy the holiday yeah thank you guys holiday yeah next weekend man what's next weekend oh the fourth man jesus man <laughs> thank you guys so much for listening and watching at home hope you guys enjoy this oh also a uh, quick side note Mike's internet cuts out right at the end of the episode, so we have the last like three minutes of it's going to be pure audio because his internet kept kicking him off of the 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 um the Browser. interview. So if you guys are still there at the end, it's all audio. So, but other than that, we don't have anything else. Thank you guys so much for listening and watching. I hope you guys enjoyed. I really had a, a great conversation with him. So thanks, guys. Peace. Support for elbows tight is brought to you by Manscaped, who is the best in men's below the waist grooming. Manscaped offers precision engineered tools for your family jewels. Manscaped recently launched the Ultimate Men's Hygiene Bundle, the performance package. Join over 4 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with this exclusive offer for you. 20% off and free worldwide shipping with the code ETP20 at manscaped.com. If my math is correct, that's about 8 million balls. That's a lot of balls, Johnny. <laughs> When Manscaped reached out to work with us, I instantly thought, yes, what a deal. I've been using Manscaped products for a while now, and when they mentioned helping out with the podcast, I, I thought it was a no-brainer. I have the Lawnmower 4.0 now, but I had the Lawnmower 3.0 and absolutely loved it. Also, most people think about Manscaped as tr- just trimmers, but really they have ball deodorant, ball toner, the weed whacker, which is your favorite thing, right, John? Yeah, I love the weed whacker. Look, I'm about to hit like 45 years old, so I got hair growing out of everywhere now. So it's coming out my ears. I'm like, man, where is that weed whacker? It's definitely my favorite. <laughs> Get 20% off and free shipping with the code ETP20 at Manscaped. That's 20% off with free shipping at Manscaped.com and use code ETP20. Unlock your confidence and always use the right tools to get the job done with Manscaped. Yeah, so, but you were saying you work out quite a bit? Yeah, mostly at uh, just doing Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. I used to lift weights, I used to be 235 pounds at 5'7, that was a pretty big boy, but uh, my frame couldn't handle it. 
You know what I mean? So I slimmed down. I think I'm a, a sleek 155 at the moment. Uh, but when I started jujitsu, I was about 220 pounds. Yeah. Well, congratulations. That's that's amazing. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I need to get there because I'm five seven, but I'm probably like good one eighty five right now. Yeah, but you wear it well. You wear it well. It's yeah. like I'm I'm five eight and I'm like two ten, but I mean I don't I feel like I don't look like I'm over two hundred pounds until I stand up and you see my dad bod and it's like you know, but it's good, it We're gives me beautiful. lots of pressure. Yeah, it does. It does. Yeah, that's what I'm lacking is pressure. I'm working on that now. <laughs> <laughs> I think it comes with, with the more time you train, the more you realize like uh, 140 pounds can still deliver like mind crushing pressure. You know what I mean? Like it's just all about 100%. It's all about 100%. where you point it. You know what I mean? Like that, that's what I couldn't understand when I first started was these guys I'd be rolling were half my size or these girls were half my size and just smashing the shit out of me. And I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe that somebody 110 pounds could feel like they're 210 pounds. Right. You know, it was amazing to me. It intrigued me. Yeah, yeah. So, hey, well, before we go on any further into your story, let's go ahead and introduce you for the people at home. Uh, go ahead and give, like, a quick who you are and um, something, you know, interesting that people would want to know about you. Mm. Let's switch it up uh, a little my name's, <laughs> oh, You bet. My name's Uki Mike. I'm on uh, Jordan Teaches Jiu-Jitsu's channel. You might recognize me from there. I'm his Uki. I get thrown around, choked unconscious, you name it. Uh, I grew up in a small town, Trenton, Ontario. It's um, mainly an army town, Air Force town. Um, really not that much interesting about, about my, uh, my upbringing. Uh, moved out west, uh, lived out there for 10 years in Edmonton, did doing tattoos. I'm a tattoo artist, uh, body piercer, part-time. And uh, other than that, I just am addicted to jiu-jitsu. I'm in there, hook, line, and sink, they call me. <laughs> so out west, where where is that in relation to the U.S.? Like, Because we're in Washington uh, State. Where would that be in like relation to us? Uh, right below, geez, I can't remember the state. I know guns are legal. You can carry them on you. I just can't remember the name. Montana. Montana, well, there you okay. Go. All right, yeah. Montana, yeah, yeah, which to me, is, being Canadian, sounded odd to me <laughs> when this person told me that because our... our we can't have open carry or even carry here whatsoever. I'm, I'm a gun lover myself. I, uh, have, uh, I like to go to the range and shoot the, the pistol all the time. But, uh, you know, it just, the story the person told me was they were driving and somebody cut them off and they went to reach for their, their gun on their dash. And I was like, what do you mean you have a gun on your dash? Like, this is I've never heard of that in my life. You know, yeah, that's a that's a beautiful thing about America. It's a constitutional right. Everyone has the right until you have the right taken away from you to to carry exactly. a gun. You know, so yeah. it's it's pretty cool. I I think uh, when we hear from other people from other countries stuff like that, they're like, like I've never shot a gun. I've never even seen a gun in person. I'm like, what? Like, yeah, they're just not oh, as popular. Well, it's the same with uh, the, the people coming up now. When I was a kid, we used to go hunting, fishing, you know, do all that sort of thing. But now, if you ask the average person, I don't think they, like the average uh, teenager, I don't think they go hunting with their father as much here, around here anyways. You know what I mean? They don't, it's not so close knit as it was when I was a kid. That's true. I'm fine. I'd say that's probably the same here as well. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I grew up in Vegas where there was, you didn't really hunt. There's a little bit of fishing, but it's like. It's mostly outdoor activities like dirt biking, uh, you know, just playing outside, things like that, riding bikes, skateboarding. We did a lot of like extreme sports, you know what I mean? Like BMX and yeah. rollerblading and whatnot. But there was, I don't, we're in the desert, so you don't really hunt in the desert, you know, you're just trying to survive. So it's like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, yeah. but so what, what got you into jujitsu? Like what, what made you, I know your story, if people haven't heard it from, uh, the podcast, it's actually a, a pretty incredible story. Um, I think it's very inspiring for a lot of people. So like what, let's go over like what first got you into jujitsu. Well, the first time I started taking jujitsu or started uh, going to jujitsu classes, it was Japanese jujitsu in the nineties, right after UFC two, I, I, I remember seeing that on pay-per-view blew me away that you know this tiny guy in a gi could just kill all these guys i couldn't believe it so i tried to find and there was no brazilian jiu-jitsu anywhere in our area i don't even know if there's a black belt in ontario that's the province i live in in canada here i don't even think there was a black belt back then so i found a japanese jiu-jitsu place and we did a little bit of groundwork it was more like judo slash karate 
you know, things like that. And then uh, I didn't stick around there very long, a couple of years, maybe got a blue belt. But then uh, I was a really bad addict. Uh, Oxycontin, oxycodone, you name it, the type of pill I used to take it. And I needed something to fill that hole when I quit. And Brazilian Jiu Jitsu was right there for me. It kept me going, you know. It, and that was the hardest part during the pandemic is when everything shut down. I almost slid right back into that horrible hole, right? So I was terribly addicted to uh, painkillers. Yeah. So what was that first class like? And were you already clean when you first started? Like you picked it back up again? Like um, how long were yeah. you clean already? I was clean about a month. And uh, it was quite a shock to the system because I went from laying around literally doing nothing, just being high all day on prescription painkillers to, you know, getting the shit kicked out of me uh, for two hours a night. And when I do something, I go all in. So I was going six times a week, you know, twice a day if I could, you know, trying not to vomit during every, you know, the first month it was just torture, you know, but I stuck it out. And uh, if I did not have that, I can honestly say that uh, I would not be here today. If it wasn't for Jordan's school, because he's really the only jiu-jitsu place around here in the area. There, there's a couple smaller ones a little further away, but closer to me. I'm really glad I ran into Jordan's uh, gym. It, it saved my life, 100%. That's interesting, too, because you would think, uh, for me anyway, I'm like, man, painkillers and jiu-jitsu. Normally, when I get done with a, a, a class, I'm like, well, Jesus, I'm in some good, you know, I'm sore. You know, but yeah. but ibuprofen has been my uh, my go to. <laughs> yeah, I was one hundred percent. Yeah, I should uh, I should be sponsored by Advil. Like, <laughs> <laughs> for what, what, I yeah. take that on a daily basis. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I had but to, I had a, like a a bitch and headache in what Thursday's class, like mm -hmm. to the point where it was like stopping me in my tracks mid technique. It, it was so weird how it happened. But I was like, oh, we're in a jujitsu school. They're, they have to have ibuprofen. And I walked over to our school owner. I was like, hey, can I get some ibuprofen? He's like, you know what? I actually don't have any. I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> How do you not have any ibuprofen in the school? <laughs> like, like people will get, like, come in sore. They come in injured. You know what I mean? Like, headaches happen, dehydration. Like, maybe we should get some, like, on the side. Like, a, like a, like you put a quarter in and you get a handful. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> There's no shortage of uh, ibuprofen at our school because there's a bunch of older guys. We call us the old man, the old man crew, right? And we're all above 40. And so somebody's got Advil, aspirin, Tylenol. Everybody's got something in their bag rattling around. It's, you know, <laughs> non-addictive, of course. You know what I mean? Right, right. So you mentioned earlier that you were, what, 40, 47, you said? 47, yes. Yeah, so yeah. have you noticed um, – well, how long have you been doing jujitsu? first of all? Uh, three years. Three years? And over those three yeah. years, have you noticed, like – Anything change with uh, as you're getting older and what was easier three years ago is harder now or what was harder three years ago is easier now because you're more familiar with it? I find, well, at first I took quite a beating, you know what I mean? Like uh, I, w I just wasn't used to it. I, I didn't know how brutal it could be. And my first class, I got tapped 20 times by a girl named Tanya who weighed literally half what I weighed. And I, I was like, how is this possible? Right. Like, how, how can somebody do this? I thought I'd walk in and they'd hand me a blue belt straight off the bat. I'd watch <laughs> Everyone does. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'll probably, you know, be teaching class next week. So, <laughs> you know, that ego, that attitude, you know, not knowing what to expect. And I got my ass handed to me over and over and over again. And um, I got used to the pain, I guess, is what to get to your question. Everything hurt. I was 44 years old when I started. Everything hurt. From day one and then I think I just built built up a tolerance to it really and that's it I, there's nothing really easier or harder I just got used to it yeah I think when you first start some of these positions or pressure like we were talking about before we started pressing record uh, these things seem so difficult to grasp like how the hell am I going to get out of this? Or how do I get used to this? And then something, I don't even know what it is. Like something just clicks and you're like, I'm not tapping to pressure anymore. You could put oh. your entire shoulder into my face. I don't care. I am not tapping to that. I, I mean, I, Neon I, Belly was like, I was talking about it. Neon Belly was like my freaking kryptonite when we first started. Now I'm like, whatever, you're just going to squeeze a fart out of me, bro. Like, <laughs> <laughs> There's one guy in our class. Uh, he's in the, he's in the service as well. He's a really tough fellow. His name's Chad, um, 
and I think it was maybe my third or fourth class. And he was doing, he goes, now this is what you call neon face. And he's doing neon face, neon sternum, mm. neon uh, ankle, like just tapping me with a multitude of odd submissions. I'm like, how do, how do I get out of this? You know? So I, yeah, I built up quite a tolerance to pain. Uh, and uh, shit, I forget where I was going to go with that. Like I was telling you guys before we started, I had COVID and it kind of messed with my memory a little bit. So if, if I veer off to try to steer me back to... Uh, to where we were going i'm exactly the same so don't feel bad yeah i have adhd too so if i start staring off it's not i'm not paying attention to you it's my brain went somewhere else for a split second yeah <laughs> i feel yeah. i feel like after having covid three times i should be immune to it at this point so i feel I three feel times eh? yeah. yeah yeah he's he can't stop oh. kissing like yeah i and guess licking yeah. his hands yeah. so at this point you know it's like i have a cold maybe i should test oh yep i got it yeah, yeah. like son of a biscuit eating <laughs> bulldog bro like, i never got it I, so. that you know of. i remember yeah. now i remember now i i used to tap out to uh just somebody just pressure just pressure being on me i would tap out i'd be claustrophobic mm-hmm. i'd be freaking out in my head and the way i got through that was I would start to count. If I can make it to the count of three before tapping, then I would, uh, that's a oh, win for me. That's, that's really a total smart. win. Because before I would tap immediately. Next time, if I could count to four, that's a win. Then five, six, seven. And before you know it, it's, it's nothing. You're so used to it. Exposure therapy, right? You just get used to it. And just like anything else, you know, if you're afraid of flying, try go look at a plane. Then, you know, get closer and closer. Then sit on it. You don't have to go for a flight. You'll be fine. Exposure therapy really works for me. Yeah, that's might not work for everybody, but it works for me. That's really smart. I didn't, I didn't even think about that. Like, that's a great tip for new people. Is like holding on, like giving yourself a timer to if you're in a position that's like extremely uncomfortable, like just three seconds. Like we talked about three seconds when we first got exposed to competition jujitsu. Yep. Like three seconds is oh. actually a long time. Like in the oh, moment, yeah. you know what I mean. So it may mm-hmm. sound when you're outside of the the situation like it's not very long, but three seconds in a roll is a long freaking time, man. You could waste a lot of energy in three seconds. Especially in a tournament. Tournaments, <laughs> that blew my mind how different a tournament was to regular rolling in a gym. My first tournament, my forearms blew up so bad. I couldn't move my fingers. I had guys massaging my arms. I was out of breath. I'm screaming like, uh, I can't do this. I can't go back out there. How can I go back out there? And my buddy's like, you got this. You got this. And he told me now afterwards in his head, he's like, he don't got this. He's going to get killed. He can't even breathe. You know? but, but just like that, I built a tolerance to it. I'd go to another tournament. I did horrible my first tournament. Second tournament, double gold. Next, oh, wow. Next tournament, next tournament was a blue belt tournament. I did horrible. So the next one I do, if you know, if the trajectory is the same, hopefully I will do well at the next <laughs> one because I know what to expect and uh, I've exposed myself to it. How long after you started did you compete the first time? Two months. Oh, wow. Yeah, too soon is, is what I said. I don't know. Everyone I talk to that you know just jumps right into it, it seems like they progress really quick. Yeah. Like, it helps them out a lot. Are they a lot younger, though? Are oh, yeah, they they're a lot younger. Yeah. yeah. See, there. I think that's the that's the magic there, right? When you're young, you don't care. You know, you're 10 foot tall and bulletproof, right? Now I'm, I'm creeping on 50. I... I can't. I can't just jump into things like that anymore. I gotta dip my toe before I can slide in there. Yeah, I've got a big joke. Um, I joke around the gym. We have a, a school that we're not affiliated with that's in the same area, but they have a specific class, but it's only for forty five and up, where the rounds are one minute less, and like they do like oh, a little really? bit of less, like of the warm up. You know what I mean? And I was yeah. like, man, I'm almost there. I'm, I'm seriously gonna have to look at that. <laughs> like in the classes earlier in the day, it's at like four vices six. I was like, hey, you know, that all sounds good to me. Yeah, we we just hit five years of training. Actually, this last May uh, it was five years of training, and it's just crazy. Just Has it in those, been that long? It's been that long. Wow. And uh, 2018 is when we started. Sorry, four years. Jesus, man, I can't get my time right. I was 39, and I'm 44 now. So yeah, so close. four years. We've been training for four years now, and uh, yeah, it's just crazy how over the that time, like things change so much, you know, especially in your journey and competing is probably, I haven't competed. John's competed once. And we always talk to people about competing. And a lot of people say like, if you want to further your jujitsu faster, competition is probably the best way to do it. Or just cross training with other schools, like exposing yourself to people outside of your normal group is a great way to do it. Oh, for sure. Because 
once you train with the same amount of people, you, you start to know little bits of their game. Yeah. So, you know, if somebody comes in from a new school and you're like, oh shit, that guy just whooped me or I, you know, I just smashed him. I, you can, it might be wrong to think like that, but you can kind of gauge your, how, how you're doing compared to around you. Cause you're all rising at the same time at the gym. Yeah. Everybody's learning, getting better around you. So it's hard to gauge how good you are. Right. So a tournament is a huge, uh, I wouldn't say it's a gauge of how good you are. Cause some people have anxiety like myself. I have borderline personality disorder, I have generalized anxiety disorder. Um, so it's really hard for me when I go to a tournament. My resting heart rate is literally like one fourth <laughs> before Jeez. I step on the mat. Yeah. It's brutal. Like I'm gasping for air as soon as we clutch, right? So yeah, it's it's hard to gauge when you're when you're training with the same people all the time. I'd say go to an open mat at another club or go try a tournament. The tournaments aren't for everybody. You know, I I might do one more. I'd like to do one at every belt level. At least. Well, that's a good way to look at it, one at every yeah. level. Yeah, I've heard a couple people say that. Do you feel like jiu-jitsu's helped with that manic anxiety and your borderline uh, personality disorder? Do you feel like jiu-jitsu's kind of uh, made you a little bit more level-headed because of 100%. what we go through? 100%. It, it forces you to overcome obstacles. It force, you can't just run away from things like uh, in everyday life if, if I'm – Let's say uh, I have a meeting with somebody. I'll just I I would just cancel it before instead of facing it head on because I could cancel it. Well, I'm at the gym. I got 45 people around me, and a guy says, "You want to roll?" I can't say, "Nah." <laughs> you know, they're like, "Why? You, you just got here." You know what I mean? Like I can't. There's no excuses. I just it forces you to tackle everything that frightens you, and and you get through it. At least it does for me. It doesn't work for everybody. It works for me. I don't take medication for any of my um, mental illnesses. I use jujitsu as my therapy. I'm not recommending that to anybody else to stop taking medication, talk to your doctor. But for me, it works really, really well. It keeps me very level-headed. I was incredibly suicidal at one point. I was uh, very uh, manic and then very depressed, very, very, very low. I have what's called internal uh, or quiet borderline personality disorder. I, I, I kind of got a feeling that uh, the press – once the Johnny Depp trial was going on, that everybody thinks that anybody with BPD just shits on people's beds and acts fucking crazy like Amber Heard did. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> but it's not like that. You know what I mean? Mine's more internal. Everything in my head, there's always some voice telling me you're doing this wrong. You're doing this. You know what I mean? There's always something I'm combating inside me. So jujitsu has leveled that right out. So like I said, during the pandemic, when everything was shut down, I don't know if everything was shut down for you guys where... But there was a point here where you weren't allowed to go in your car to go to the store. You had to either go to your doctor's, uh, the pharmacy, or a supermarket. If you were caught going anywhere else, you could get uh, a big fine. So that was brutal for me. So interesting. Luckily, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy. But luckily, I have a, a buddy who's a brown belt, and he lives five minutes from my house, and he's got mats in his garage. So we'd beat the hell out of each other. <laughs> well, he'd mostly beat the hell out of me, right, uh, for about – four times a week for about three months for a three month stretch there where we weren't allowed to have a shop open. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's tough cause I wasn't a business owner, you know, during that and the, you know, a lot of us are like, well, you know, whatever, we'll buck the system. We'll do whatever. But as not being a business owner, like it's a bit different, right? Cause yeah. if you stay open and they say you got to be closed, you know, that's a different ball game. It's like, yeah, it's well, very well, here it was a $20,000 fine. Whew. Jesus. If, if, uh, if a gym, I believe I, don't quote me on that, but I believe that's what I heard, that the health unit could fine you up to $20,000 for, for running while, you know, during a pandemic, during a shutdown. That's crazy. I was yeah. actually rolling in San Diego. I was, like, in the middle of a roll at, yeah. the, at, a, at a local gym there, and the health department walked in, like, while we're rolling, and it was supposed to be shut down. And, uh, oh, you know, they, yeah. they pulled the black belt, the, uh, the owner, to the side, and they're like, hey, you know, we're in the, the COVID pandemic. You're not supposed to be open. Da, 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 on and on and on he kind of like talked to him and, and shoot him out the door and uh you know basically after that we just covered up the windows and everyone came in through the back but yeah but still like it is a risk and i get it but i think it's funny because i guarantee most of the people that go to that facility are willing to accept the risk to continue to train yeah and uh you know it's just it's an interesting group of people yeah i cannot confirm nor deny whether any gyms in the area did the same <laughs> But uh, I know that when we were allowed to be open, we would have these crazy regulations where 
you could tape off uh, six, as long as you're six feet apart from somebody. Oh my God, the cubes like a, on the mat, right? Yeah, like Same. a two meter by three meter square or two yard by three yard square close enough, right? Um, but then six feet away, there was somebody right there and you, you were only allowed to have one person out of your 10 person circle. In Canada, we were allowed a 10 person circle, which you were allowed to be around. So you were allowed one person outside of that circle. What? And that was my training. I know, it's insane. <laughs> it's insanity. <laughs> It's crazy, but at least where I, the part of Ontario where I live, that's that was yeah. the law. So you know, Jordan had everything according to uh, health regulations. But I mean, it's right th- the person's right there. If you're gonna. <laughs> yeah. Nobody was wor- none of us were worried. We're all in decent health, like uh, physically. Yeah. We're, you know, you. I don't think you can be in very bad health and do jujitsu and survive very long. You know what I mean? Like. It, well, a lot of it and just with, yeah, a lot of it just doesn't make sense. Like, you don't have to be <laughs> yeah, a rocket science to go. Well, let me see. If I have to wear a mask to the dinner table, but then I can take it off at the dinner table. I mean, come on, really? Yeah. Like, you know, a lot of yeah. stuff you just come. Come on, it doesn't make any sense. You can't catch COVID <laughs> while you're eating. Right, right. Yeah. yeah, it's like, come on, really? <laughs> yeah, it's insane. I started off being, you know, the perfect little Canadian, like follow the orders that were given to us. But man, like. Four months in, I was like, this is bullshit. <laughs> I switched from like, I started, I was pretty liberal, and now I'm kind of, I don't know, I'm, 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 I'm in between now. Right, you know? right. We, it's really opened my eyes, this pandemic has. So True. when you got back into training after the shutdown and everything like that, was there like a grace period of where you had uh, your cardio was not as good or you forgot techniques or um, like, was there like a grace period of like, Refamiliarizing your refamiliarizing yourself with jujitsu full time. A very short one because luckily I was able to train with that brown belt friend of mine, friend of mine in his uh, garage for the three months that we were totally shut down. So we we go we went pretty hard and we focused mainly on leg locks. So that's where I learned uh, a lot of my leg lock game. I can uh, thank my training partner for that. You know, so but no, there wasn't very much of an adjustment period. Uh, we'd go pretty hard in the garage, so my cardio was just about the same. Maybe a, maybe a couple of weeks, and I was back to where I was. Were you still a white belt at this time, or were you already a blue belt? Uh, I got my blue belt. Uh, it was August twenty twenty. So, yeah, that was in the middle of the pandemic. Yeah, yeah. So when I came back, I was uh, I was a blue belt. Yeah. Did you uh did you have any when you were a white belt during this time? Did you have a any what was the hardest thing for you when you first started training? Like what was the hardest thing to grasp in jujitsu oh, when you first started training? Just all of it, all of it. It took me like it was like everything was written in another language. It was like trying to read hier- hierogly- hieroglyphics. You know, like nothing made sense. Even they, I remember specifically this one day, Jordan was showing. Um, X guard to reverse X to the saddle or 411, right? And um, and I, in my mind, I'm like, what the fuck? Like, I, I don't understand. <laughs> this makes zero sense. Why why would you go reverse after X? And then, it, you know, like my mind is on fire. I'm like, I'm never going to get this. This is crazy. So I'm about a month and a half in and I'm sitting there after, during class, I'm slumped over and uh, I felt this hand on my back. And, and there's a guy named Jake that went there and I can thank him for this. He, uh, he could see that I was about to quit. Like he could see that there was a point where, I don't know if you guys have seen this on people's faces, but you see guys have been there for about a month, two months. And you can see like this guy is good. He's about to break. And, and I was broken at that point. And this guy noticed that. And I thank him every day for this. Cause he came and he put his hand on my back. And he goes, I know exactly how you're feeling. You feel like you want to quit. You you don't get this shit, and it's crazy right now. But believe me, if you just keep showing up, just keep showing up every day, you'll get it. And then I was two months in, and I had that light bulb moment, that holy shit moment, where all of a sudden, oh my god, I understand what he means. And then I started to progress very fast after that. Like um, uh, it was just crazy in my mind. It was like I I got it. Like a, a puzzle piece just slipped in, and all of a sudden, you know, I understood what all this stuff meant. Not all of it, obviously, but, you know, up to the point where I was. It just made sense to me now. I definitely think if you can last two, three, I think six, to me, six months is the, is the point where you're like, 
you're pretty familiar with a lot of concepts in jujitsu and you can understand jujitsu to a, a level of being able to ask questions that are meaningful, right? When you first start, you know, you get asked all the time, like, do you have any questions? And you're like, I have no base of knowledge to ask a question. Yeah. Like everything is a question to me. You know what I mean? Like I need to see a technique 15 times and do it 300 times. And then, then I might have a, a question. You know what I mean? Like, uh, it's really hard for beginners to um, ask questions or even grasp concepts or ideas that are not just as simple as put your hand here and l- put your weight here. Even putting your weight in right. is, is hard to understand sometimes. Like, like I want you to – like, I was working with the new white belt on Wednesday in our beginner's class – and he was in side control, and just the simple thing of, like, he was too far over on his side control, right? Like, his head was completely yeah. away from my center line, and I was like, man, don't you don't want to go that far over because it's really easy for me to just reverse you and yeah. take take side control to you. I was like, you really just kind of want in center line, and he was like, oh, they didn't even – they no one mentioned that. I was like, yeah, it's just like something that you kind of just learned from <laughs> trial yeah. and error. <laughs> yeah, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. No, I've, uh, when I had that light bulb moment, everything clicked in and, uh, uh, it's gone pretty smooth since then. Actually, the first couple months was just terrible, but I do that too. I'll be helping somebody out and they're like, I don't get, I don't get this. And I'll, I'll show them, I'll explain some things to them. And then they're like, okay, okay. And you can see it slowly starting to, okay, okay. And then boom, you see them roll. And then you got your prodigies, right? Where there's a couple people in our class right now that you show them a move once and they'll tap you with that, like the next role. And they're lower than you in rank, but they just pick things up so fast and it just clicks. I wish I had that sort of brain. Uh, my, my, dream, my main training partner, Alexi, we mention him on the podcast a lot because he's just one of those guys that he was there, I think, uh, like we wanted him to have this blue belt. At, he, he, he got his blue belt about a year and two months. But I mean... In our eyes, he was a blue belt at below a year, like really? to the other guys. He was he was hanging with us, no problem, tapping us too. Yeah, I used to get hung up on the names a lot. You know, they'd yeah. start naming everything, and I was like, I've never heard of this stuff. And I was trying to remember every name, and I was like, whatever, it's in Japanese. I don't even know what they're talking about. Yeah. And then uh, I found it was actually easier for me to learn when I stopped trying to give everything a name or trying to remember the names. And I like what about our instructor now is people ask like. Hey, what move is that? And he's like, I don't know, but it chokes you. And I was like, <laughs> like he won't, you know, he won't yeah, give everything yeah. a name. And I, I'm like, I like yeah. that because it, it, I don't know, it frees up mental space for me to just remember the technique. I used uh, the yeah, word case of Katami. I was like, oh, so we're going to go side control case of Katami. And he's like, I don't know what that means. I'm like, uh, yeah. <laughs> scarf hold. He's like, sure. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Psych control yeah. number two, whatever you want to call it. That's where we're. <laughs> no, I totally get that. I forget half the names of stuff, especially, like I said, memories shot lately. But uh, I couldn't imagine being at like 10th Planet where oh. everything's a completely different name. Like I, some of the names are so cool. I, I love it. Right. But like I love doing their uh, lockdown system. I, yeah. I love that. When I was a white belt, I hyper focused on lockdown to electric chair submission. And that worked very, very well for me. It usually works very well once, yeah. and then the person is hip to it, and then you can't catch them with it anymore. Like at least in my experience, I've tapped out high level guys with it, and then only once. They're like, "What the hell is this banana split shit you're doing to me right now?" Like, you know what I mean? And they're like, "Okay," and then they'll just maul me after that, and they know how to stop. <laughs> I remember. You know, so. I remember. It's so funny you bring up Tenth Planet stuff because that is how quintessential is that white belt days of you're like. I'm going to go learn as much 10th planet stuff as possible, even though it's not always going to translate perfect into like gi or no gi when you don't, you're not in that system. Because I remember the same thing, like our buddy Phil, he, he found Eddie Bravo's lockdown system to electric chair. And it's funny because he tried to hit that on me one time, right? He got me on the lockdown and then he went to go electric chair me, but he was so freaking strong. He ended up calf slicing me with his lockdown. Not even it oh, wasn't yeah, even that. electric chair. He just calf sliced me with like the pressure, and I was like, "Bro," I was like, "I don't even know what you just did, but my calf almost ripped in half." He's like, "What?" <laughs> I was like, "I've had that happen to me too." Yeah. yeah, and you know, it's it's funny because people 
when they when they first start, they like we just said, like they go into that whole Eddie Bravo's, you know, rubber guard and whatnot and these things. And it's like, look, man, how about you just understand even more of the basics before you go into some of these systems that he comes up with? Because they are very elaborate and they do translate a lot into another. It's a you know, it's a whole system like the 10th planet, like yeah. everything can flow into another and how about you just learn how to break someone's guard before you go into rubber guard or, or something like that? Like, that's just how I see it. What about you, John? Well, that's that's what the black belts would tell me at yeah. the, the gym. I'd be like, hey, you know, I learned this online, this lockdown to this and that. And they're like, do you know how to, you know, do a proper, you know, X, Y, or Z move? Yeah. And I'm like, uh, I guess I don't. Maybe I should get the fundamentals down yeah. before I start veering off. I, I love YouTube for, for learning. I think it's fantastic. I even learn a lot from, Jesus, Jordan's my instructor. And I learn a lot from his videos because it just drills it into my head. Because sometimes in class, there's, you know, 40, yeah. 45 people there. And you can't get, like, singular attention all the time, right? So I'll watch his videos afterwards, and it just drills it into my head. Don't let them grab your head. Don't let, get your underhooks, you know. Even as a blue belt, I should have already known that stuff. But it just keeps drilling it into my head, and I love it. Well, I think at the blue belt level, I'm continually telling myself that I should know better than that. I yeah. should know better than that. I yeah. should know better than that. But whatever. I mean, <laughs> you know, like it just—it's just how it is. Completely. How agree. do you guys? How do you guys find uh, when you got your blue belt? Did you guys find like you had a target on your back from the white belts? Uh, like, did they did they go harder on you? Did anybody go harder on you as soon as you got that different colored cloth around your waist? I think I think they might have done a little bit, but we were such a when we got our blue belts, our school was still really small, even smaller than it is now. And so every after we got our blue belt, it was pretty much a whole school of white belts anyways. We only had like three or four colored belts out not even like we had one one or two blue belts. I think it was husband and wife were blue yeah, belts. That was it. Yeah. And then a purple and then two purples and one black. And that was all our color belts and like 300 white belts. It wasn't that many, but you know what I mean? Like it was <laughs> yeah. a sea of white belts. And so a lot of us started together. So we were already kind of going hard on each other and whatnot. And it was more along the lines of like, um, we were just the first group to get our blue belts. And then it was kind of like a succession after that of like everyone that started pretty much got their blue belts relatively yeah. close to each other. So, I don't feel like there was a target on our back per se, uh, but maybe I put my uh, target on my own back. You know what I'm saying? Like I was like, all right, now I'm a blue belt. Now I can't let my friends get to get me because my yeah. belt's different colors. Even though yesterday yeah. it was a stalemate and we were going back and forth, now all of a sudden my blue belt makes me have more skill. You know what I mean? In my mind. Yeah. So that I, I think honestly it was probably more of that than uh, them putting the target on me. I, I had a an idea in my head that I was no longer allowed to be tapped by my friends. Well, that's, that's the point I was uh, kind of getting at was when I first got my blue belt, I felt like if I get tapped by a lower belt, I can't let that happen. I can't yeah. let that happen. But that's a horrible, that's a terrible mentality to have it. Right. Like the first time I got tapped, I was like, Oh, this sucks. But now I use it as a learning experience. You know what I mean? Like it, 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 gets rid of that ego that you have. You can't have any ego when you do jujitsu or, you, I mean, you got to have a little bit of ego, but I mean, I had an overbearing ego when I got my blue belt. I felt like I should be able to do this. I'm a different color. This, I should be able to do X, Y, or Z and I get tapped. And now I'm happy when somebody lower than me gets tapped because if I show them a move and they tap me with that move, it makes me so happy that I taught them something and they can tap me with it. It's, I've done a complete 180. Yeah, one of my our buddies, Justin, he's been doing jiu-jitsu since day one pretty much with us, and he's a no-stripe white belt. And it's just because he has consistency issues because of injuries and, like, work and stuff like that. And so he's n never really been there for promotion nights, honestly. Like, he's always busy during promotions and night. But he's been doing it just as long as I have almost, and he got me in a guillotine the other night, and it was it was a good one. Like, I was like, oh, shit. Like, I'm Justin just tapped me, bro. It was like I went into, like, I was just messing around. You know what I mean? I went in to shoot, and he was like, zoop. Zipped it up real quick, and I was like, "All right, that no, that was good." He's like, "I'm so sorry that I hurt you." I was like, "No, that was good. Like that was legit." Yeah. I had a tap because one, the pressure was insane, and two, it was like gritting my teeth. You know what I mean? Like yeah. that feeling where you're like, 
oh, this really hurts. I should probably stop this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I don't feel like the separation is that large between a white belt that's been doing it for a couple of years and a blue belt that's been doing it for a couple of yeah. years. You know what Agreed. I mean? Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. So, like, it, it doesn't bother me. And we, man, when I was like, I wish they would give these guys their blue belts. You know, yeah, Keegan same. and Jack and all those guys. I was like, give them their blue belts because they are way too hard to roll with. Like, you <laughs> yeah, know, like, hook that's, them up. That's exactly <laughs> yeah, exactly. It was like I was saying, a guy named Alexi, we were all hoping he'd get his blue belt soon because we, He's tapping all of us. We're like, holy shit. You know, like, give this guy his blue belt. <laughs> but, and he ended up doing it. But with him, when he was a white belt, I, I'd show him how to do a, a heel hook. And I said, in my head, the first time he heel hooks me with it, I'm going to be so happy that, that he, something I showed somebody, he can get me with it. And he got me with it, you know, like two, three weeks later. And I, I was so happy. It made me so proud. That's why I love showing people techniques. And hopefully someday when I'm a black belt, I'll love to teach as well. What was your blue belt promotion like? Did you, we haven't asked this question in a while. Did you have to, does Jordan test or is it kind of just on the spot? You, you're like, boom, here is your blue belt. It's pretty much when he feels you're ready. We do have a uh, grading maybe a couple times a year where the whole class sits around and everybody, you know, people get stripes and belts and stuff like that. But I mean, normally it's, if you deserve a blue belt, he gives you a blue belt. I'm, I'm 99% sure of that. Uh, one day I did very well. I was a four stripe white belt. I did very well. I ended up um, uh, putting a guy out from another class, from another school. He was a couple belts above me and uh, put him out three times in a roll. And one of the black belts said, I found this out afterwards, said to Jordan, I think Mike's ready for his blue belt now. You know, like, He's, he's doing pretty well against, you know, the blue belts. He's hanging with them pretty well. And sometimes, you know, he gets lucky with the uh, higher belts too. And so I, I think they had a conversation and Jordan was like, okay, there you go. You know, he's ready for it. So it's pretty much when he feels you're ready for it. Are, do you think that we had to test for our blue belts, right? It was a big, extravagant. It's an hour long. Hour long class of just us getting our ass kicked for an hour and just everyone in class cycling through us and having to do 10 different techniques of takedowns 10 like three side control escapes like just like uh he would call things out and we would have to do something that we know from that position do you think because of like your anxiety and stuff like that that you would not do as good in a situation like that because that's kind of like where we go back and forth about it like i hate it i told him I'll, i'll never show up again if they tell me I'm going to test on a day, I'm not going to that, that day. I'll pass. Yeah, yeah, I I would freak out. I wouldn't I wouldn't know what to do. I was even getting anxiety while you were saying that. <laughs> imagining. I was imagining a circle of people yes, and then me in the middle yeah. and you somebody says, "Hey, do a uh, uchimata." And I'm like, <laughs> "What the hell is that?" <laughs> I could do that yesterday, but now yeah. that everybody's watching, I can't do that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like uh, that's the part that kills me is the pressure of everybody. Even when I'm rolling with somebody and you hear somebody from uh, the sidelines yell, John's know, favorite. Throw a guillotine, throw, and the other person's coaching the other person. I'm like, holy shit, there's people watching me. And now I really have to perform. You know what I mean? It just, it yeah. just makes my head go crazy. Yeah. yeah. My wife and so kids are in the stands. Physical. Come on, daddy. Yeah. I'm like, this yeah. is horrible. <laughs> Leave me alone. Turn your back. <laughs> Don't look at me. So how do you do during competition? Do you like when like people coach you during competition or you like, shut the hell up. Let me do my thing. Like you're just making it worse for me. Well, my first tournament, I couldn't hear anything. Everything. I'll, it's like, I was looking through a, a tunnel. I couldn't, my ears were ringing. I couldn't hear anything. And I uh, just ba- basically blanked out. So I don't even know what that was. I don't even know what happened there. I, uh, close to passing out almost. Just some guy on top of me, hugging me for five minutes. And I heard muffled voices and was looking through a, like a peephole. It was so <laughs> strange, right? So, uh, yeah, tournaments are really rough for me. But this, like I said, I got used to I knew what to expect for the next one. So the next one I performed a lot better. But... Yeah, they're terrible for me. Ter- tournaments are torture for me. But I want to do them because standing on that podium at the end with your medal, or even not, just, just going to the tournament, afterwards you always feel better. You feel great after a tournament. So Win lose or draw. I'm kind of the same way. So, uh, you know, if so what I like it is um, if it's a fear or something I don't like, I want to face it, and then I feel better afterwards. 
So for yeah. me, like with the competition is I knew I wasn't going to like doing it. So instead I just went and watched one first with the guys at our school that were doing it. So I could know what to expect. And then once I knew what to expect, it was a lot easier. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I was like, um, how did you, you said you did a tournament. You went to one tournament before. Yeah. I've just done the one. I went and watched one first and I went and did one. And, um, you know, it wasn't that bad per se. Um, I think uh, it was definitely a different experience from the gym. I don't know if I'll do it again because I felt like it took me like six months to recover from it. Like I don't, I think I dug some hooks in so hard I might have tore like my groin. I was <laughs> like, I was like, man, it was like pretty rough on the body, you know. No, oh, especially at you were at white belt when you did this tournament. Yep, yep. Especially at white belt, I noticed that everybody is so stiff. You'll see people grab each other and their arms Bro. are stiff. Everybody, it's crazy. Elk locking it, horns, yeah. bro. That's all it is. It's just like, and they're 100%. just going back and forth. And at the wide-eyed, crazy stare, <laughs> people just like, they don't know what to do, and they're freaking out, and you hear coaches screaming. <laughs> it's like uh, just a perfect storm of, of anxiety, right? So, But that's what I wanted to get past, and so I forced myself to do it, and I'll force myself to do it again. You know, and hopefully that'll make it that much easier because now I can go into a restaurant and sit down and the clanging of people cutting their food and the TV over here and the discussion over there doesn't make my brain feel like it's on fire because I just went through a tournament and I had a man try to strangle me to death. You know what I mean? So <laughs> yeah. it makes that makes everything else in life so much more tolerable. That's where it's helped me with, again, with anxiety and with uh, BPD a lot. Isn't that crazy to, like, to think in your head like this dude ch almost trying to choke me unconscious actually makes me more level-headed you know yeah. what i mean like it's such yeah. a crazy idea because to the people that don't practice jujitsu or don't participate in the gentle art of folding clothes with people still in them don't understand like there's a lot of mental therapy that comes through going through this adversity even with your friends oh, yeah. you know what i mean a hundred percent. I'm way more level headed, way calmer person. Like I said, I can tolerate things. If I, I used to walk into a room and if a, a kid was screaming and crying and the TV's on, I'd be like, Oh my God, I'm going crazy. But now it's just another day. You know, I can, I can make it through what, uh, what a normal day at the gym. I can make it through this. No problem. Do you think because you train so much, it also helps a lot more? Like if you trained less, it, you might have a little bit more of that adverse anxiety. Oh, for sure. Really? If I miss a day, I I start to regress immediately, in, in uh, mentally. Uh, if if like uh, we, the only day we're not open Sunday. So even the Sunday that we're not open, like I'm like, oh my god, I really miss. You're like going putting in blinders there. on, headphones on. You just yeah. sit in your room, pitch black. Just <laughs> I'm, watching, I'm watching YouTube. I'm watching, <laughs> I'm watching uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu tournaments. I'm watching, you know, Eddie Bravo versus uh, Hoyler Gracie too. I'm watching. Everything to do with jujitsu. I'm 100% obsessed with it. The only reason I don't go tw do two a days on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday anymore is because of the price of gas. The price of gas is so high, I can't afford to oh go in. Oh my God, isn't that twice crazy, a day. man? It's insane. Is it? It's like, super high up there right now for you guys too. Yes, yeah, like two dollars and twenty cents a liter. I don't know what it is a gallon there for you guys. Uh, we're out down near like six bucks. Yeah, about and some six dollars a gallon. So yeah. yeah, I'm looking at getting like an electric bike at this point. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, man, I'm going to invest in a Tesla or something because <laughs> it can't keep going this way. It's crazy. I agree. Agree. So you have a, a, a pretty sick beard. Do you feel like that gets in the way of you training at all? Do people like grab <laughs> onto it and they're like, this is a grip like your belt now or. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nobody's ever grabbed onto it and used it as a handle. Uh, I don't know how I'd feel about that. I don't think I'd like that very much. There you, you know? go. Somebody um, try it. And I will know. <laughs> <laughs> I have had people say, you know, one while they're trying to do a guillot or a rear naked choke from, am I hurting you? Like, am I pulling your beard? I'm like, nah, man, go ahead and choke away. Whatever happens, happens, right? Like people are more, uh, they're asking me if I'm okay with it. it doesn't bother me at all. Do you it braid it away. or anything before class? Like how do you prevent oh, it from you getting should... at people's mouths? Well, that'd be intimidating. They just like have to. Yeah, they just have to accept that they're going to get some air in their mouth. Probably. <laughs> there's one, there's one guy in class. He sweats so much. I sweat a lot. Like, I mean, I I'm a really heavy sweater, but this guy, and he'll admit it too. So it's not like I'm, you know, talking shit behind his back. Whenever he 
he rolls with somebody, it's like an oil wrestling match. It's oh, I've had Jesus Christ! Sweat in my eye, my ear. The ear is the worst. It's worse than the mouth. Definitely worse than the mouth. Uh. The ear, because you can't get that shit out. The mouth you just spit, right? But when you get two or three drops of sweat in your ear, you're like, this shit's going to be with me for a while. You know, that DNA is in there. Oh, <laughs> so my God. That's the worst part. I'd take that over a beard brushing up against me any day. The worst. Or I'd take the beard against that any day. The worst I had was a salty toe that, like, literally went to the back of my throat. <laughs> I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> that was the worst. We had a black belt. We had a brand new black belt come from class, uh, from another gym to our class. And he was wearing a blue and orange gi. It was a, or sorry, blue and orange rash guard. So I thought he was a blue belt. It was a Pokemon uh, rash guard. I had no idea he was like a high level black belt. So I'm rolling him. I'm like, why is this guy kicking the living shit out of me? And he's the same rank as me. But the first thing I did, I went to push him away and his mouth was open. I stuck my finger halfway down his throat, <laughs> gagged him. And he's like, I was like, sorry, dude. <laughs> you know, that just felt like such an ass after that. You know what I mean? Like, but I, I've punched Jordan in the face countless times. And I thought, oh my God. He's going to, he's like, dude, I get hit harder than this in MMA. That's nothing. He's just used to it, you know? But I, accidents like toes in the mouth yeah. and fingers being rammed down people's throat. I think that happened quite well, a bit to everybody. Well, so we can't help with with toes in the mouth or fingers in the mouth, but hair we can't help with with Manscaped, right, John? That's true. That's true. So summer is coming and the sun is shining. Shirts are off and your balls are smooth. <laughs> you heard that right. Your friends at Manscaped are here to make your bench... Your bench, beach come ball. on, man. Your beach balls are smooth and Floridian sand, as smooth as Floridian sand. Jesus Christ, this stuff is ridiculous. In the summer, you want to kill some cold beers and barbecues, not kill the vibe with pubes peeking out of your swim trunks. Unless it's the 60s or 70s. Oh, my God. That's why Manscaped has their performance package 4.0 to keep the party in your pants looking crisp and refreshing all summer long. Dive head first into the summer by joining 4 million men worldwide who trust in Manscaped. And get ready for a hot guy summer by going to manscaped.com and get 20% off and free shipping with code ETP20%. That's right. The Manscaped Performance Package 4.0 has everything you need to prepare for the summer. There, Mike, just letting you know. Inside this package, you will find... The Lawnmower 4.0 trimmer, the Weed Whacker Ear and Nose Hair Trimmer, the Crop Ball Deodorant, which is great in the summertime. I'll tell you that right yeah, now. It's like lie. 80 it's degrees yesterday, and my balls were feeling crisp and chafe free. <laughs> all right. The Crop <laughs> Revive Toner, Performance Boxers, and a traveling bag to hold all the goodies, right, John? Yep. Yeah, and don't forget you get a 4000K LED spotlight. That's right, I mean, which which really helps when you're trying to see the pubic hair as yeah. you're sh- shaving in the shower because the Lawnmower 4.0 is waterproof, which is really nice. I don't recommend doing it into the shower because sometimes it clumps up and you might nick yourself, but it is nice to have that light. So, Manscaped uh, even threw in two free gifts to their Performance Package 4.0, the Manscaped Boxers and the Shed Travel Bag, which will bring your comfort to a whole nother level, which is actually really nice because I stole all my Manscaped stuff in that Manscaped bag that comes with it. It's it's pretty nice. So, You want to take your grooming further? Take a look at Manscaped Shears 2.0 as a package and has everything you need to look pristine, nail-cutting tweezers and grooming scissors. The Performance Package... With Performance Package, your balls will be ready to impress, but make sure you cover the rest with the Shears 2.0, and you'll be ready to perform head to toe. So get 20% off plus free shipping with the code ETP20 at manscaped.com. That's 20% off plus free shipping with the code ETP20 at manscaped.com. This is the summer to turn your package into the full package with Manscaped. Thanks, Manscaped. All right. Sorry about that. I'm sold. (laughs) Look, 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 I'm not joking. Like, uh, see, I'm, I'm not like, joking. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna buy one after yeah, this. I'm not e- even joking. That e- sold me. That was amazing. ETP. Tw- I'm telling you, man. If you get that perform, like this is not even like an ad. Like no right. longer the ad. I legitimately, I think the performance package 4.0 is the best bang for your buck, man. You get so much good shit in there. And the, I mean, even if you don't use the trimmers for like your beard or whatever, like if you want to trim up your chest hair or armpit, leg hair, whatever, they're great. You know what I mean? So. And then you get all. I just got one of those twenty dollars jobbies from Walmart, and man, they cut 
they cut. They just put that <laughs> cutting. It well, ain't fun. Manscaped has that skin safe technology, yeah. so it's it's less yeah. likely to to nick you. So it's it's yeah. it's, it's quite I'm, nice. So no joke, I am gonna. I'm gonna do that. Well, I'm gonna I, buy as soon as we get off here. I yeah. appreciate that. With, I mean, with a beard like that, I can imagine you might be a little hairy. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a hundred percent. We we used to always joke when uh, we first started. And Travis would roll. He never wears a rash guard, and uh, he would slide this hairy nipple all the way up to your mouth. <laughs> And you'd like you're turning your head, whatever. Like no, it was horrible. Yeah, was that's horrible. back when I was fit and in shape. Now my dad bod. I'm like, I ain't trying to put my my jelly rolls in someone's mouth like it's a dessert. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> well, before if you, if you watch our podcast, Jordan talks jujitsu. Um, the BJJ Joey, he's a black belt as well, and he has a movie when when he he used to be about 225 pounds. He's about the same height as me. He's lost a bunch of weight. He's doing a tournament coming up. He's about 160 pounds now. But when he was 220, 225, he'd do a move called Mother's Milk, where he would just lay his belly on your face. Oh, my and, gosh. And, you know, you couldn't get out. And you say, what the hell is that? Mother's Milk. And he would just tap you with that. I've tapped that. Mother's Milk is yeah. horrible. Not anymore, just, though, right? No, not anymore. Can't do that anymore. Mm. He's, he's, he's uh, trimmed right down now. What do you think has Amazing. been your, your biggest lesson learned uh, since you started jujitsu? Humility, hmm. humility to be able to uh, not have an ego to uh, put somebody else's um, safety in front of my own, you know, just stuff I should have known before, right? Stuff that I like, I uh, grew up without very much. Uh, mother died when I was really young. We didn't have a lot when I was growing up, so I didn't get a lot of life's lessons, right? So I had to learn things the hard way. I really wish I had Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu when I was a child. But, uh, yeah, I've learned a lot of life's lessons in my 40s that I should have known in my 20s. That's why I don't go by my first and last name online. I go by Uki Mike because I'm I'm a whole different human being than I used to be. You know what I mean? Like uh, before I was, I just, I wouldn't go out of my way to help somebody. I wouldn't do this, I wouldn't do that. And Jiu-Jitsu has shown me, given me honor and respect and I makes me appreciate everything I, it's it's so weird that it just it just makes me appreciate life so much more and like i was saying earlier it literally has saved my life 100 percent. i know people throw that around a lot jujitsu saved my life and i know it's almost becoming like uh on discord on jordan's discord somebody was saying that's you know that's you know, soccer would have changed your life too uh, well for me it's jujitsu it literally saved my life so yeah, it's taught me to be a kinder human being yeah, John brings up a good point all the time. Like the beautiful thing about jujitsu is there's no hiding. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like you have to face those demons and those adversities. Like, and how someone handles it is is a true show of character, right? Oh, for sure. Like the, you know, you're not hiding anything on the mat. You know, no, the mats don't lie. They one hundred percent. You can't act like a like a badass tough guy, and then you're like, okay, let's go roll, and then you know, you, you have to be a badass tough guy if you're gonna act like one. You know what I mean? Like. It, it'll it'll show who you truly are right away, and it, and if you stick with it, it'll change you. It'll make you a better human being, in my eyes. All right, Mike. Well, since we're having technical difficulties, we'll go ahead and just uh, end the the intro or the 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 interview right there. Um, thank you so much for coming on. I know you're like super self conscious about it when we we're leading up to this. I think you did a great job. One of those times when your internet first cut out, I literally told John, I was like. This guy is crazy because it was a you flowed great. You had great answers. It was an amazing conversation. I'm sure a ton of people at home are going to find a lot of value in what you have to say and how honest you are with with everything that we went over today, man. So thank you so much for coming on the show. I really greatly appreciate it. Thank you guys. It was it was an honor to sit with you and Robert Downey Jr. I'll, I'll send you an autograph, man. Don't worry about <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah, thanks, man. I appreciate it. <laughs> so if if uh if you could give one piece of advice to a white belt, who, what would it be? Uh, it would be well quickly. It'd be a two parter. It would be slow down, relax, don't use all your strength, and stick to it. You know, don't go at it like a bat out of hell. Just take enjoy the journey. You're going to be a black belt. You're going to be somewhere in 10 years. You might as well be a black belt. Just take it slow. Don't use all your strength for everything and relax. Just enjoy it. Yeah, enjoy it's the beautiful. ride, man. Enjoy it. Exactly. It's, it's, it's a marathon, not a sprint. So. Exactly, 100%. That's, I couldn't have said it any better. So if people want to follow you, 
to get more of that that amazing Uke Mike beard and everything, where can they find you at? Like, what beard oil? You know, like, you know, I'll find it out. <laughs> I'm on in, uh, Instagram. It's uh, Uke Mike, Uke dot Mike on Instagram, U-K-E dot M-I-K-E. I'm easy to find there. And uh, this is all natural, baby. I don't use any beard oil. <laughs> Where, where, and you're you're the co-host on Jordan teaches jujitsu too, right? If people yes, want sir. to go check that out, where they can, where can they find your guys' podcast at? Uh, it is on everything, um, uh, Google, Spotify, everywhere you can find a podcast. Jordan talks jujitsu is on there. Plus, we have a YouTube channel. It's under Jordan Pressinger. Perfect for the podcast specifically. Yeah, and watch watch his YouTube channel. Jordan teaches jujitsu. <laughs> Well, Mike, once again, thank you so much, man. This was greatly appreciated. Uh, I had a blast. It was a really good conversation, man. You're super down to earth and can't can't thank you enough. So, John, you got anything else? No, man. Thank you. Fantastic. Yeah, you did a great job thank today. You. So, thank you guys for listening at home. Thank you for watching at home. If you're still here on YouTube and you see the picture, uh, this was a whole lot of fun. So, remember, no oil checks here. Oof. All right, guys. Thanks. Thanks.